Hello and welcome to lecture number 28 in the course Advanced Robotics. In the last class, we started our discussion by looking at the grip transform that relates the velocity at the fingertip and the uh, velocity of the object, that is when you want to move an object with some velocity, that is object manipulation, what is the relation between the object velocity and the fingertip velocities. Then we started our discussion on uh, locomotion and we said that locomotion basically means, means moving from one point to another point, either by walking, running, swimming, okay, uh, or in air by flying. So locomotion essentially is moving from one point to another point. And we are focusing our discussion on legged locomotion, that is uh, we are having legs, uh, it can be a dog which has four legs, it can be a human being who has two legs or quadrupeds, hexapeds, who have multiple number of legs to move from one point to another point. We started also talking about gait and today we'll start, uh, we will continue our discussion from gait and then see that when you are having gait, for example, different kinds of gait and you want to optimize gait, that basically means that we want to go from one point to another point, there could be multiple ways by, by which we could go, for example. A uh, dog has four legs, so it can lift the diagonal legs, like in the case of the big dog, and move forward. Or it can move, it can uh, use one leg at a time to move forward. Okay, so there are different types of gait. We'll uh, start off our discussion from there and then proceed and see that if you have different kinds of gait, how do you optimize gait? And I'll, we'll focus our discussion mainly on biped locomotion. And uh, then we'll see that if you want to build a biped, you want to optimize the energy, how do you do that? Okay. Okay, so today we'll continue our discussion on uh, biped locomotion, where we'll see that uh, first we'll talk about gait, and then slowly we'll move towards uh, uh, biped locomotion. And that is as the cartoon figure here is indicating that uh, we are using two legs to move forward. Okay, and you can also see that the hands are uh, moving in sync with the legs. And uh, something interesting to note here is that the concept of energy optimal gait, that is, we can walk in different ways. But it's very interesting to note that all human beings walk almost in the same way. That basically means that we biologically or we have evolved such that our gait is optimal in terms of energy. Okay, so uh, just for historical interest, the we said that 1921 Karl Kapek was the first person who used the word uh, robot or robota in the Czechoslovakian language when he wrote his play uh, of uh, mechanical men replacing human beings in uh, industries to do dirty jobs. Here also, if you see that the first concept of the robot actually is a biped. Okay, so it has two legs, so it's a biped. Okay. Now, uh, Isaac Asimov, 1942, most of his science fiction stories that he wrote also basically considers humanoid robots. So humanoid robots having human uh, capabilities. Okay, like they can do tasks and they can think, they have some amount of AI and things like that. So this concept of humanoid biped is not new as far as uh, science fiction and uh, Karl Kapek is considered, but it took us very long to come to biped essentially because, because of the fact that wheeled robots were the earliest robots and wheeled robots were the earliest. Uh, why? Because if you have four wheels, you can see that uh, this doesn't require balance. Okay, the, ro the robot is balanced already. So if you just leave it there, it stays there. If you rotate the wheel, it goes forward. So uh, control is simple. Uh, in terms of energy efficiency, it is simple. Whereas if you talk about a biped, immediately you need what is called balance. That means a bipedal system is essentially unbalanced. It's dynamically unbalanced system. So what we say is dynamically unbalanced system. Okay. And hence we have to balance it always. This may, So this would mean that it requires more energy and uh, it, it is more uh, computationally expensive in terms of kinematics to get a biped robot to walk. Okay, just uh, revising, here is one of the famous uh, quadruped robots, which is the big dog made by Boston Dynamics. And we talked about gait in the previous uh, class, we, and we said that gait is the pattern of, pattern of foot placement. Now, if you have a leg uh, like this, and so the pattern of foot placement would basically mean, it does not mean the kinematics or the shape of the leg. It basically means that whether you're making contact with the ground or no contact. So there is a contact or it's in contact or it's in air. So there are two conditions, either it's in contact with the ground or it's in air. Okay, so it's binary, so one, one zero kind of. So when the robot is walking, uh, please note very carefully that the leg contacts, the, there are four legs here. So there are four contacts and if I draw the top view of the robot like this, okay, there is one leg here, one leg here, one here and one here. 
okay then you you note very carefully that uh, it is having diagonal kind of gate which basically means that these two legs will be in air then it will switch and the other legs will be in air so first the red color will be in air then the yellow color will be in air and that is the way it is walking so at any time two are in air two legs in air okay that is the way it is a diagonal kind of gate which this robot is using to move forward okay the other thing that you should note is that if you look at the shape of the legs please look very carefully if i draw the side view the shape of the legs is inward bent like this okay uh, whereas in the case of a dog it could be forward bent like this okay so uh, this is basically it is probably more stable uh, gait that it is having so please note these things in the video very carefully and then today we'll discuss in more detail uh, what do you mean by the gait and uh, how do you optimize gait how do you do the kinematics etc so please note the gait that this robot is using at any instant two legs are in air and two legs are in uh, ground so in between the robot could instantaneously be on four legs on the ground also okay but that is a very small very very short face okay so this uh, is basically showing that the robot is walking in such a way that two legs are on air on any instant look at the shape of the legs they are bent backwards okay so today we'll also look at uh, we'll also have a discussion on degrees of freedom of the legs and things like that now this is a, a bipedal robot which is atlas also made by boston dynamics and it can walk it is bipedal okay so again if this is my this is my head and this is my hands the hands are not doing much you can see they are just standing there they are not moving and if this is the side view then the robot is like this okay please note that the legs are bent there they are not straight they are bent so today we'll also try to see why the legs are bent so if you see a bipedal robot walking you'll always find that the legs are bent it doesn't walk straight human beings walk straight okay so if i talk about a human being now this is a human our legs would be like this straight okay there is no bend there whereas in the case of the robot it is like this okay that is essentially because for balance and stability uh, th this kind of bent structure is more stable than this structure because this behaves like an inverted pendulum otherwise so it can fall very easily in that side or this side okay so uh, this basically showed a bipedal robot which is uh, walking and going from some point to some other point on the ground and uh, it is also having a gait whereas in this case there are two legs so the gait would have uh, one leg on air then two legs on the ground and one leg in air and then two legs on the ground so it's two one two one two one which is a little different from uh, the gait of the big dog that you just saw some time back okay so we'll discuss these things in more detail today okay so we said that the gait is the pattern of foot placement so this basically means whether the leg is in air or or on ground okay so there are two conditions only now if it is on ground we mark it with a black color and if it's in air we just leave it uh, blank okay so uh, to talk about uh, by gate of a biped so for a human being if i take my front view here okay these are two two hands on the two sides these are uh, legs two legs and if I take the side view, the side view will be something like that. This is my side view. Okay. And this, these are the arms. So we have two legs. So we have, we can uh, talk about this as the right leg and this is the left leg. So if I draw my gait diagram, this is going to be right leg. Okay. This is my right leg and that's my left leg. And it is, uh, this is a different instance of walk. Okay. So this is T1, T2, T3, T4, like that. Okay. So this is my left leg. That's my right leg okay now we when we start off normally we are on two leg stance so both legs are on the ground means it is like this then one leg goes up so if i take the side view one leg is in air if you can imagine uh, this is my rear leg which is in air and this leg will go like this and this fellow is on ground okay so the rear leg will go forward like this and become the front leg and the body moves forward okay so we are on two leg stance which is this one then we come on one leg stance. So the right leg is on the ground and left leg is in air. So the one that is on the ground is marked with a black dot. The one that is in air is left blank. After this, the next instant will be two legs on ground. Then it is going to become uh, one leg on ground, then two legs on ground. Okay. So this is the gate uh, for a biped. So you can see that it's uh, one leg. So it is one leg, two legs, one leg, two leg, like that okay on the ground that is the way we walk 
Now, what is the difference between run and walk? Interesting question. So in walk, normally, rather, uh, it'll be this cycle. This is walk. So one leg, two leg, one leg, two leg. That is walk. What is run? Run can mean two legs on air. Two legs in air. Okay, and then uh, one leg on ground. Okay, so the running gait would be would have uh, instances where both the legs are in air, whereas walking is basically an instant where either two or one leg will always be in contact with the ground. Okay, that is the difference between running and walking. Now uh, let's see further. In the case of a, a quadruped robot, which has uh, four legs, so this is my in the forward direction. This is the forward direction in which the robot is. Uh, now let's say this is a dog. Well, this doesn't look like a dog. Maybe it's a robot. Uh, is walking forward okay so this is uh, it has four legs so this is my right front this is the right uh, right back this is left front left front and left back so there are four legs and each of them are marked here okay now you can see that in instant t1 this is my instant t1 there are two legs on the ground this one is on the ground that is on the ground so lb uh, lb and r f are on the ground are on the ground so we are marking it with a black color here and here okay at this instant t1 and the next instant what is happening is here t2 which is also called the changeover phase okay so it is basically changing the legs which are in air what is changeover uh, changeover phase are is the phase where legs in air interchange Okay, so in the case of the biped robot, if the right leg was in air, then it will become two leg and then the left leg will go in air. Okay, then again, the right leg will go in air. So this, this change, is, change phase is called the changeover phase. Now in T2, all four legs are on the ground. They are marked with uh, black dots. So you can see that all four are on the ground. T3 is uh, in the first case, the right was on the ground. So now the left is on the ground. Okay, so the left is on the ground. Okay. And then all are on the ground again, again change our face. So this is the way it goes. This is basically called the gate diagram. Now, because there are four legs here now, is there any other way by which this can move forward? Yes, of course. So for example, if you have four legs like this, okay, if I'm drawing it uh, this way, then at any one instant, you can have three legs on ground, on ground, and one in air. Then four can be on ground, then one in air again. Okay, so rather let's say four legs, four legs on ground, one in air, then four on ground and one in air again. So in this case, it is two, two. There's two legs which are in air. I'm saying that you can also walk, this robot can also walk with one leg in air and three on the ground. Okay, because it has that option. In the case of biped, we don't have an option. You have two legs only. So either both the legs are on the ground or one is in air. Both can't be in air because if both are in air, then it's running, it's not walking. So here, basically, we are saying that uh, there is a different way for having a gate. Now, if you are saying one leg is in air and three are on the ground, okay. But then which leg is in air? So depending on your gate, you can actually have a different leg in air each time. So you can have different types of gate. Okay? That is what we are going to see today as we go along. Okay, so we talked about static balance and dynamic balance. So in static balance, we are basically saying that the robot is walking very slowly. It's almost like it is static. Okay, so accelerations uh, x double dot is almost good as zero. Okay, accelerations are very, very small or they're almost zero. So in that case, how do we define balance? We define it by saying that in this case, we have a hexapad. We have uh, six legs. And at this instant, three legs are in air. And three legs are on the ground. So this, this, and this are on ground. Now, the legs that are on ground, if you join them with straight lines, what you get is a support polygon. This is called the support polygon. Now in the support polygon, the projection of the center of mass, if the projection of the center of mass lies inside the support polygon, we say it is balanced at that instant. Okay, and how do we define it? We can come here and see, so this is the top view. If you see it from here, what you'll see is this triangle, this is the top view, and this is the projection of center of mass. The distance D1, D2, D3 from either of the boundaries is called the, is called the stability margin. So the minimum of this distance, d1, d2, d3, is how stable it is. For example, if um, the center of mass were to go this side and d2 becomes this small, 
position then it is less stable okay so that is one definition of stability margin the other is longitudinal stability margin in the direction in which the robot is moving you have d1 here and d2 here the distance from the boundaries okay so the minimum of d1 and d2 will give you the longitudinal stability margin again okay but uh, please note this is static balance so it is working very slowly and now let's look at uh, different kinds of gate so this is a quadruped so this is a quadruped robot means it has four legs okay we are not talking about the shape of the legs we are not talking about the size of the legs those things we are not considering here we are just considering the gate the pattern of foot placement now in this case in this quadruped we are saying that at any instant at uh, a time or rather let's say at time t okay either four legs are on the ground or one leg is in air okay four on ground or one in air one in air means three on ground okay that's how it moves forward okay so basically it has four legs one two three four which are marked in this figure here so if you look at the gate diagram then what we are seeing is that at any instant we have uh, the number of legs which are on the ground can vary now okay one two three four of them are there so let's uh, see here this is called the wave gate this this uh, gate is called the wave gate so one two three four are the leg numbers so one two three and four so at time equal to zero okay so in in this case they are using normalized time which means that uh, one full cycle is made up when four legs have moved okay that means uh, i'll just explain what that means so it basically means that at zero one leg is in air three legs are on ground okay then the next instant all legs are on the ground okay. then one is in air again okay so uh, here the next instant would be one will be in air so here three are on ground here uh, this one is in air okay here this fellow was in air like this fellow is in air then this fellow is in air and then that fellow is in air okay and in between all are on the ground here so at this instant you see they are all on the ground okay so let me explain it again how they are drawing this gate so here you are seeing this one is in air then all four are on the ground then this one is in air all four are on the ground then this one is in the air all four are on the ground and then this one is in air so all the legs have uh, been in air once so this fellow four was in air then two is in air then three is in air then one is in air okay and in in the in the changeover phases so this is my changeover phase okay in the changeover phase all four are on the ground okay now this means that at any one instant uh, one leg is in uh, either the all four are on the ground or one is in air okay now if that be the case then what is the way by which which leg is going to be in air okay, so if i look at this figure now this figure basically tells me the cycle in which it is going the so first leg is in air then number two is in air then number four is in air then number three is in air and then number one it comes back to one again okay so whereas you can also have this cycle in which it starts with uh, one then becomes four then becomes two three one okay you can have uh, the other way around also one two three four one okay so these are all the various possibilities of uh, which leg is going to be in air or what is the sequence in which the legs are going to be in air so each of this we will have one diagram like this okay i hope you understand uh, here basically what we are saying is that there are four legs so which one is going to go in air for example uh, let me take the example of the first one here the first diagram here and say so the first one is in air this one is in air then the second one is in air then the fourth one is in air so like this fourth one is in air then third one is in air and then comes back like that that is this one okay or we could have cycled it it's such that if i take uh, this one now let me take this one if i cycle it that way let me uh, change the color so if i take this example now so it is one is in air sorry uh, it starts from yeah one is in air then from one what will happen the fourth is in air this is in air like this okay then from four it is three is in air like this and then from three it is two is in air then it's one so you can see it's a cross kind of a gate which is coming that is this one okay so these are all the possibilities by which this four-legged robot can go forward and this gate is called a, a creep gate okay 
It's also sometimes called the wave gate of a quadruped robot. Now, there are two terms which are called, which is called duty, uh, duty factor and phase for time. Okay, what is duty factor? Duty factor is, uh, which is defined by uh, beta, so support period of leg I by total time T. Okay, so total time T would mean the total time for which all the four legs have actually moved. So here it is like, that is where this four is coming from. So it's like there are four phases here for each of the legs to move once. Okay, so the duty factor beta is equal to 0.75 in this particular case. Okay, now uh, this gate is called the creep gate. Now you can have more number of legs, like this is a hexapet. Okay, so this is a hexapet having six legs. Now in this uh, six-legged uh, robot, we are having a wave gate, okay, which is having a beta of two by three. Now in this case, at this instant, you see that there are two legs in air. This is in air and that is in air. Okay, so five and four are in air. So five and four are in air. Okay, then uh, what is happening is uh, at, at this instant, this, this, so five is in air till now. Okay, and uh, these two are in ground. Then what we are having is this fellow is in air. Okay, and this are on the ground. Okay, so this is a kind of gate which, uh, which is uh, also called wave gate with the beta equal to two by three. Okay, so wherever this uh, line is there, that means at that instant it is in uh, it is on the ground. So this is on the ground. Okay, so this one uh, number five is on air. Okay, now in this particular case it is two is in air. Okay, and then here three is in air, and here uh, six is in air. So at any one instant, one leg is in air here, you can see, okay? So at this instant, you can see one is in air, here one is in air, here one is in air, here again one is in air, right? So this again can have different combinations, which way, which leg is going to be in air, because there are six now. In the previous case, you had four. So you had this many variations, which are possible. Now you have six. So there are more number of variations which are possible, okay? Now, Wave gate with the duty factor half is this one. Duty factor half basically means, half here means how many of them are in air. Okay, so if it is half, that will mean half the legs are in air. So it is three is in air, two is in air, six is in air. Okay, this is the meaning of uh, half. Okay, so please go back to the definition of uh, support period of leg I by type T. That is the meaning of the duty factor. Okay, so here we are getting uh, this fellow is fully in air here. That means half the time this fellow is in air, then other half of the time this fellow is in air. Okay? And there are six legs, so there are six parts. So this is uh, one, two, three, four, five, and six. Okay? Here, duty factor two by three uh, means the same thing here. Okay? Which basically means that out of total time, if I do two by three into six, okay, there are six parts. So into two into two is four. Okay, that means four legs are on the ground at any instant. So there is one, two, three, four on the ground. Okay. Okay. So uh, this is uh, so this is basically what we talk by wave gate and uh, creep gate. Now you can also have pace gate and bound gate. This is something that we have seen in the case of uh, the quadruped robot, like the one we were just looking at the video in terms of uh, the uh, big dog. Okay. In that case, it was using diagonal legs for moving. So two legs were in air at any instant, okay? So in this particular case, in this uh, pace gate, uh, this is my pace gate. So one, two, three, four are the leg numbers. One, two, three, four. So one, three, two, four are here. You can see that this instant, okay, two, four are in air. Okay, one, three are on the ground. So one and three are on the ground. And the other two are on the air. Then there is a, a changeover phase. And then what happens is the other one, one and three come on the air, one and three, and then uh, two and four are on the ground. That means it is going not diagonally, but sideways, these two legs, and then, this, then these two legs are interchangeably in air. Okay, so it is not diagonal, it is side side. So if I draw the legs like this, then uh, what it basically means is these are my four legs. Okay, then it is going this side, and then it is going this side. Okay, and interchanging. In the case of the big dog, it was crosswise. It was like this, like this, like this. So in the case of the big dog, it was like this. And uh, then it was uh, like this. 
okay so this is what we call by a pace gate and the gate diagram is shown here okay so uh, the other gate is the bound gate okay so this is my bound gate which can be used for running running or jumping also so uh, th this is a bound gate in which we have one two three four legs so we have three and we have four which is in air so three and four that means the front sides in that particular case if these are the four legs then the front is in air okay, it is like this these two are in air then this then uh, in the next shot four are on the ground and and then this is in air okay so this was the big dog okay this is basically what we call the pace get where it is going sideways uh, sideways legs are on air or on ground and here this one is called the bound gate okay in the bound gate only the front legs or the back legs are in air and this is my gate diagram okay now these are different kinds of bipedal robots that have been built for a very long time quadruped robot inspired by mammals big dog is probably the best and uh, these are the corresponding uh, gate diagrams for the uh, for the robots so please draw the gate for the big dog if you draw the gate for the big dog it will turn out something like this it is diagonal legs which are moving okay so it will be almost similar to this i talked about the instantaneous support okay so the inst this can be instantaneous that is the four legs on the ground for the big dog uh, one leg would be instantaneously on the ground and it will take off okay now uh, yeah so this is the uh, concept of gait now let's move forward and look at frames at joints now we have seen that we define each leg so this is my leg okay this is my leg okay and there is contact here this is my um, this is the leg now uh, the first question that comes out is how many degrees of freedom now if we say it is two degrees of freedom then uh, the two degrees of freedom will be one joint here one double root joint here one double root joint here so it's a two dof uh, two dof the simplest okay, you cannot have one dof so it will have two dof for each leg now this is the body here okay so that's my body and there is another uh, sorry the legs must be of what will be the length ratio of the lengths they'll be same length okay there's something which we said okay so this is my two legs and these are degrees of freedom which are there so each leg has degrees of freedom per leg so each leg each leg has uh, two degrees of freedom okay so each leg has two dof okay now uh, we are going to do the kinematics of this so basically i need to find i need to put frames at the joints so we have to follow the dh parameters to put the frames at the joints and then we can have a global frame so what i need to do is put frames at the joints and this will be my z axis okay as per dh notation and then correspondingly i can put the x axis so x axis can be this side okay so the first thing that we need to do is to put frames at the joints and uh, we can relate the frames by means of the one is the rotation matrix okay that is one and the second is the homogeneous uh, transformation matrix okay so uh, the rotation matrix is something which we have studied so rotation is always about z theta and that matrix is cos minus sine sine cos 0 0 1 this is something we did at the beginning of the course and the homogeneous transformation matrix basically relates two matrices n minus 1 to n and this consists of the rotation matrix here and uh, the translation between the two origins this is 0 0 0 that is 1 this is the distance between two frames uh, sorry uh, distance between origins of two frames okay that's the homogeneous transformation matrix so by using the homogeneous transformation matrix we can actually find the relation between one frame and the other frame and in order to find contact i can put another z here and put an x here okay because i want the contact point also so although there's two degree of freedom i basically want uh, the relationship of the the end of the foot also with respect to the body frame 
okay now uh, uh, this is exactly how we do the frame assignment now please note that unlike a serial arm manipulator this uh, robot is moving around in space okay so we need to put a local frame and we need to put a global frame now this is my global frame global frame or fixed frame okay which is fixed and which doesn't move then I put a local frame okay which is put put at the center of the body sometimes it is put at the CG of the body okay so global frame and uh, local frame have been put local frame is at the CG of the body and global frame is put anywhere outside and I know that this one to start off with what is that vector I know that vector okay that means I know what is the local frame with respect to the global frame yeah. now how does it move forward next is I have to put frames on each of the uh, or I have to put frames or axis at each of the joints so let us assume that the degrees of freedom per leg is 2 okay so it has 2 DOF per leg okay, so there is 1 DOF here and there is 1 DOF here and I also need the foot point contact so I have my uh, z-axis in this direction so these are my z-axis okay and by using the homogeneous transformation matrix I can go from here to here here to here and then from here to the local frame okay that means I can find what is the contact point uh, I can find transformation between uh, foot contact foot ground contact and transformation between foot ground contact and uh, the CG frame and if you have uh, the uh, with relation to the CG frame you can also go to the global frame right so and this can be done for each leg for so for each leg so uh, you can look upon this as a serial arm manipulator okay you can if I reverse the problem suppose you are thinking uh, suppose uh, I invert the problem what do I do I put this robot upside down okay so if I put it upside down what will happen this leg is like this now okay so the body has come down and this is my uh, CG now now this is like a serial manipulator it's exactly same as a serial manipulator you would have studied uh, the robotics of uh, the frame assignments of serial manipulators in most textbooks so here what we are seeing is that if I consider this to be a serial manipulator this is not moving this is my z axis x axis y axis then this is one degree of freedom this is another degree of freedom and uh, this is the contact point x y we can say x y z also okay so each of this is behaving like a serial manipulator okay. and then now you know how to do the frame assignments and do the kinematics okay so it is exactly similar to our serial arm manipulators where we are considering each arm to be equal to a manipulator okay so each arm is equal to a manipulator that is how we are uh, modeling this and how we do the kinematics okay now the robot has to move forward how does it move forward so this is a quadruped there are four legs so at the simplest case we can talk about a creep gate or a wave gate such that at any instant one leg moves forward okay so this is the leg which is moving forward this leg here and it takes a trajectory like this and comes here for example I can say the leg was here okay then it is going to go like this and will come there okay so I hope you can imagine so the leg the, uh, the the tip of the leg is having a trajectory which is like this that's how it's going forward and when that, that is happening the body is also moving forward by some distance so the body will also move forward by some distance that means what is happening is that the angles of this leg are changing of course this is a two-link manipulator this one degree of freedom here another degree of freedom here so it is uh, behaving like a two-link manipulator like this so it is taking a trajectory like that okay this is a fixed point now this point is also moving and in the other legs because the body is going forward this leg will bend slightly forward like this the body has gone forward now okay so which basically means the body has gone forward now I hope you can imagine that okay so this points will be on the ground but uh, the joint angles will change a little bit such that the body goes forward a little bit so the body will come here now okay and in the process this one leg has gone here the next so that is one step 
In the next step, all four are on the ground as per the gate diagram. Then one leg is going to go on air again, one of them. So it could be anyone depending on which gate you are following. Okay, so suppose the next one is this one goes in air like this. Okay, so this one is going like this. In that case, it will go like this. Okay, and the body goes forward a little bit more. So what you're seeing is that as one leg is going forward, the body is going slowly, slowly forward. Okay, so you have to do the inverse kinematics of this two-link manipulator system. And uh, inverse kinematics of two-link manipulator system is very easy, which we have studied before. So after we do the frame assignments at joints as per DH notation, we have done inverse kinematics of the arm. So inverse kinematics of two DF uh, systems we have done. Okay, so please look at uh, the earlier notes. So it is something like this. So for a fixed link manipulator, it is like this. Okay, now we, this is like the leg, the inverted leg. Okay, so there is one angle here, theta one, and this is my theta two. Okay, this is my point x y. This is l one. This is l two. So I can find the values of uh, so x is equal to l one cos theta one plus l two cos theta one plus theta two, and y is equal to l one sin one plus l two sin one two. And I can solve this theta two is equal to this is x squared plus y squared minus l one squared minus l two squared by twice l one l two. This is cos theta two. Then I can find uh, sine theta two by taking one minus cos theta two squared, and then I can uh, use the a tan two function. So theta two is equal to a tan two sine two cos two. Then I can find theta one. Okay, so this has been done. So basically, we can given a trajectory here. What kind of trajectory we are following? Some trajectory like this, right? So trajectory was like this. I've drawn it upside down so that you can understand. Now it can be the other way around also. The way it was in the robot was like this. The leg was like this. Okay. So here we are having uh, my angle theta one and this is my angle theta two. Okay. So this is having a trajectory like this. Okay. Okay. So basically, this is uh, what the trajectory was here, this trajectory. So this is my angles, theta 1 and theta 2, and this is the trajectory of the end effector. Okay. Now this is also moving. So this moves a little bit, determined, uh, it, that is determined by how much the body is moving forward. So we can do the inverse kinematics this way and find what are the joint angles when the robot is moving forward. Okay. So inverse kinematics means I give you these points. Okay. It can be a cubic spline. We have studied cubic splines, so it can be a cubic spline that the leg is following a cubic spline. So you can find the xy coordinates. Then for every xy, you can find what is theta 1, theta 2. And then this also moves forward a little bit. Okay. So this is how we do the inverse kinematics of the quadruped robot. Each of the legs is considered to be a single uh, manipulator, which is moving. Okay. And uh, we are going straight. So Two degrees of freedom per leg is okay. This robot cannot turn. It can only walk straight. So this fellow can only walk straight. Okay. For straight walking, this is enough. If you want it to turn, then you have to increase the degrees of freedom. Okay. So if I want uh, the robot to turn also, then I'm going to need uh, three degrees of freedom. Okay. So uh, let me just go back here. So uh, straight walk. We have uh, the robot which has two degrees of freedom each, the two df per leg. Now, if you want to turn, then you need one more degree of freedom, which is about this axis. Okay, so this is one axis, second axis. So you need one which will be about that axis also. Okay, so it needs to turn. Okay, so for turning, you need three degrees of freedom per leg. So for turning, you need three df per leg okay so if it's 3 df per leg then it is 3 into 4 which is 12 degrees of freedom system and this is 2 into 4 which is 8 df system okay this is for quadrupeds now uh, this is how you do the inverse kinematics of this robot now how much it will go forward that can you can determine okay so per leg is going this much so the body will probably go half of that Okay, or much, or maybe one fourth of that. That you need to fix geometrically, as you need to move this also as it is moving. Okay. Okay. 
this is an example of uh, a gate of uh, of this uh, quadruped robot okay so at any one instant you see it is taking one leg only okay so these are uh, very simple robots which are made by students this has two degrees of freedom per leg at any one instant it is simply moving one leg forward three legs are on the ground then four legs are on the ground then one leg is in air that way okay so this is what we call creep get or wave get okay now you can have different variations of it for example you can have diagonal gate as in the case of a big dog okay but it's more difficult to control so now you would uh, understand what we are talking about in terms of stability so when we talked about stability so we talked in terms of stability and said that if there is a if this is the robot when we talked of static stability okay so these are four legs and we said that if one leg is in air and three legs are on the ground if, if I assume that these three are in air then the triangle made there is called the foot, foot support polygon and the projection of the center of gravity has to lie in that foot support polygon that is what we saw in terms of static stability okay so this is my foot support polygon and if I see the top view of that so the top view will be something like this now let me draw the, the robot in some of the in this configuration so these are the legs and at any instant let me say the three legs are on the ground so this this and this are on the ground so my polygon is like this now okay. if this is the CG projection of center of mass is in the polygon now it is balanced the moment I say I'm using a diagonal legs to be in air so if this is my diagonal legs those two are on air what is happening to the foot support polygon it is becoming a line okay so the center of projection of the center of mass has to lie on that line okay otherwise it will fall okay so in terms of stability this diagonal gate is not very stable a creep gate is much more stable because you have a bigger polygon okay but using this diagonal gate you can walk faster because two legs are in air okay and this is a dynamic kind of a balance which is going on as we come to dynamics we'll see what we mean by this dynamic balance okay so this gave us the example of uh, uh, how the robot is walking forward you can do the simulation of this very easily considering each leg to be two degree of freedom manipulator arm and at any one instant only one leg goes forward three legs are on the ground okay okay now as we proceed we are slowly we looked at quadrupeds we looked at get slowly let us move towards the area of bipeds Okay, so when we are looking at bipeds, uh, bipeds as the name indicates have two legs. So biped as the name indicates means two legs. Okay, and uh, now these two legs, interestingly, uh, these two-legged robots or bipeds, they can be active or they can be passive. Okay, what is an active biped and what is an uh, what is a passive biped? Now for this system to move you have to give it energy for any system to move say if I have a mass which is a mass which is lying here I want this mass to move I have to give some force which basically means I have to give some energy to the system to move okay so I have to give some push to the mass then the mass will move and come there so I have to give some force into distance uh, f into d some energy has to be given to this uh, system to move right so for this biped also it requires energy to move Okay. Now, in the case of an active biped, it has motors at the joints. Okay, so you can see that this is an active biped. The one on the left hand side is an active biped and these are motors. So these are servo motors. We had discussed servo motors. So each of those joints have servo motors. How many degrees of freedom? Let's not worry about it now. Let us just say that it has uh, 448 degrees of freedom. Okay, so there is uh, two degrees of freedom here, one here, one here. Okay, so there is four plus four, eight divided. And uh, it has eight degrees of freedom and uh, it can walk straight okay now each of these motors you are going to give voltage to the motors and the motor will rotate that is where the energy is coming from so my energy means electrical energy okay 
So this is basically called an active biped, which has active motors which have been controlled such that the robot can move in a particular direction. Okay. Now, can you have a robot or a biped robot which doesn't have motors but can walk? The immediate question comes, where is the energy coming from? Okay. Now, this is an example of a passive biped. Now, a passive biped has no motors. Okay. And you can see here that this passive biped, there are no motors here. There are links and there's a revolute joint there. And these are legs which have a particular shape. Now, where is the energy coming from? The energy is coming from gravitational energy. Energy is gravitational. It's basically gravity or gravitational energy. Okay. So, this can walk on an inclined ground. It cannot walk on flat ground. Okay. And the concept is very interesting. The concept is like that of a wheel. Okay. So, this is the wheel. Uh, let me draw a bigger uh, picture here. So, this is a wheel. This is a much bigger picture I'm drawing. When the wheel is on flat ground, what is happening to mg? This is my point of contact. This is mg. This is the point of contact. Okay. So, it is, so there is a force. It, so, this mg force is coming through the point of contact and there is no moment there. So, the wheel, when you are keeping this wheel or a ball on a flat ground, it will not rotate. Why will it not rotate? Because there is no moment to make it rotate. Now, the moment I keep the wheel on an inclined surface, like uh, if I keep it like this. Now, what is happening? This is my contact point and the mg is like this now. Okay, mg is coming here now. Now, this is the contact point and mg force is coming this way. Okay. So, what is happening is this force into that distance is a moment which is being generated about that point. Okay. So, what is happening? Because this moment is generated about this point, this wheel will start rotating in this direction. That is why it rotates. So, if you keep a wheel or a ball on an inclined surface, it will start rolling down. Why is it rolling down? Okay. So, why is it rolling down? It is rolling down because of this. So, exactly the same here what we are seeing is uh, on an inclined plane, if I keep, this is my contact point. Mg is going like this. So, there is this Mg into that distance x. So, Mg into x. Okay, Mg into, so Mg into the distance x is the moment that is coming or the tau which is coming about this point and this is going to make the wheel rotate. So now you would have seen bicycles. Okay, I'm sure you've seen bicycles. Now these bicycles have uh, spokes on the wheel. Okay, okay. So this is a wheel. Let's say this is a bicycle and uh, this is spokes which are there on the wheel. Now, if I just take this one and this one, let me change the color. So, if I take a part of a wheel, only this much, okay, then this one spoke here, another spoke here, okay, and this is behaving like a part of a wheel. Now, if this is behaving like a part of a wheel, then this should apply. That means if I put this on an inclined ground, uh, this is my ground like this now, okay, it's making contact here. What will happen? This will rotate because mg is going this way now, okay. So, this is a part of a wheel and this is the way it is shown here. So, this is one leg, this is another leg. So, this is one leg. This is one leg, this is another leg, and this is one leg like this. It's a part of a wheel. Okay, so very clearly you can see that uh, this is like it's a complete wheel. This one is like a wheel, okay, like a bicycle wheel which has spokes. And what you have done, you are just taking this one and you're taking this one. Okay, so what is happening is that it's becoming like a part of a wheel. And this is the part of a wheel. This is one leg and this is another leg. And this fellow's soul is like this, this fellow's soul is like this. Now, if I keep it on an inclined ground, it'll start going back. It'll start going down. Now, it can rotate about, this is a revolute joint. So, what is going to happen is, if I keep it on an inclined ground, this leg will go forward, body will go forward, and will keep moving forward like that. Who is giving the energy? Okay, so this wheel is rotating here. Where is the energy coming from? It is coming from Mg, which is a gravitational energy. Right? So, gravity is pulling it down. That's why it's rotating. Okay, so this kind of robots are basically called you know, passive robots. Okay, they can be called passive robots. They are also called uh, self-propelling systems, self-propelling machines. Self-propelling means that there is no energy that is being given. It is working by itself. Okay, now if you are not convinced, uh, you can have a look at this one. This is the video which is showing a self-propelling machine or a passive walker which is walking down a slope. There is no motor anywhere. 
So there are two legs which are connected by a revolute joint. And if you look at the shape of the legs, they are circular or spherical actually. Okay. So they are bending from side to side and is walking forward. There is no motor anywhere. So it is behaving like a wheel and it is coming down and uh, uh, coming down for uh, and walking right so this is basically what we call a passive walker and these are called passive robots okay they walk by themselves okay this is an interesting uh, you can make one yourself where you can make a passive robot and make it walk uh, by itself okay now this is another example uh, this uh, toy is a passive walker and it's called tuk tuk okay, because it makes the noise tuk tuk when it is walking and how does it work these are two legs this is one leg there is another leg okay two legs and the shape of the legs if i draw it uh, here if you see the shape of the leg is like this okay so it is semicircular here and semicircular legs are there why semicircular so that it can bend on this side and it can bend on this side okay and uh, it works forward so the shape of the leg if you look at uh, the previous one if you look at the uh, the passive walker that we have shown here if you look at the shape of the leg it's semicircular here notice very carefully on this direction also in that direction okay so this is my leg it's like part of a sphere okay, that is the shape so it can bend on that side and it also rotates on this side so if you look at uh, this passive walker that was walking you'll notice that uh, it is actually bending on side to side and also rot rotating in the in or rolling in the front direction okay so like the legs are a part of a sphere okay now this is uh, tuk tuk which is the toy and it has weights on both sides okay so it is walking down an inclined surface by bending side to side. So it will go from this side to this side. So that the contact goes from this leg to this leg. So the contacts are basically changing. So if I draw it here, one leg is like this. Okay. The other leg is like this. Okay. And there are weights which it, it is carrying from this side to this side. So once it's that side, then it's this side. So contacts are changing from this leg to this leg. So one leg, it is changing from left, right, left, right, left, right. And because it is inclined, on the side direction, if I draw the side view of this, the leg is like this. Okay, so what is happening? This is part of a wheel. So it is rolling down. Okay, so let's have a look at the video. It makes it very clear how it's working. So you can see that this is no motors anywhere. So no energy being given to it. How is it walking? Down an incline? It is getting the energy from the gravitational energy. Okay, so gravity is pulling it down. And uh, that is how the energy is coming. And this is a very interesting... Uh, a walker which is called a passive walker so there are several types of this passive walkers which are used uh, to study dynamics in order to understand dynamics of uh, passive systems like this and these are the simplest biped robots which can walk with no motors okay okay uh, yeah so those are passive walkers but now let's look at dynamic walkers now, dynamic walkers require balance. Okay, why? Because uh, as you see that the uh, the biped robot is walking, so there is some acceleration which is there. Okay, so acceleration, correlation, centrifugal forces, and gravity forces are there. Now, uh, a bipedal system is inherently an unbalanced system. Okay, so this is an unbalanced. Okay, what does it mean? So if you look at this. this is basically having one degree of freedom here like this and there is a rotating degree of freedom there okay so by con by controlling this uh, degree of freedom it can basically jump up and down because there's a spring there okay so it can change its uh, position of the body like this okay and if it changes the position of the body what would happen is the cg is being uh, shifted right so it can go this side or it can go this side now okay so depending on that and it can jump up and down by moving the springs there so this is the one of the earliest biped robots which is basically a jumping robot 
and this one can jump up and down and uh, it can go forward okay now this gives us an idea of uh, dynamic balance and uh, this is a robot which is controlled so this has uh, two controls are there number one the first control is controlling the body altitude that means this inclination angle i'm going to control okay so this i can control by controlling the position and the velocity this way by using a pd controller so this is a pd controller which is controlling the altitude of the body the second is uh, the amount of extension that is there is l okay so this i can control by also looking at fl is the force that is uh, by controlling the hopping height so i can control the hopping height by using fl is equal to this equation which is also pd controller so that's p this is my p part and this is my d part so by using this controlling both of this i can actually control how this is uh, how this is hopping along this is basically called a hopping robot okay the video is not working but in the next class uh, we'll start off with this video so this basically shows us the simplest hopping robot which is dynamically unbalanced and because of this dynamic unbalance okay so today we looked at the concepts of uh, gate then we looked at active biped we had looked at passive bipeds and we saw the different kinds of passive bipeds and then we slowly moved towards active bipeds that is this hopping robot so in the next class we'll start off with the video of the hopping robot which makes it very clear how the robot can hop around okay so you can control the it's basically jumping jumping and it's statically unstable why because it cannot stand in one place if you try to make it stand it'll fall okay as long as it is, as it is jumping it's okay but the moment you want it to stand uh, it won't stand because it is dynamically unbalanced system okay so these were some of the earliest robots which are called hopping robots and in the next class we'll continue from here we'll look at the video of this hopping robot and see how we proceed towards uh, design and control and optimization of uh, uh, of uh, bipedal systems thank you so we'll stop here today thank you